This conference will now be recorded. Thank you, everyone. And um, my name is Michelle Briggs. I'm the Chief Park Ranger, also uh, known as the Lone Ranger at the Sioux Area Office and at the Sioux Locks. I'm the only Corps of Engineers Park Ranger for the state of Michigan. I have been working at the Sioux Locks since 2009. And I will start with a disclaimer that I am not an engineer. So if you are wanting to ask me things about the specs of a crane or the lifting capacities or the uh, tensile strength of something, I'm probably not going to be able to answer that. But I have been here for over 10 years and I spend much of the winter following our work crews around, watching, taking pictures and asking them questions, trying to learn more about what they do because I find it incredibly interesting. Uh, one thing I'd like to ask real quickly is how many people have been to the Sioux Locks before? If you could just uh, indicate that in the chat. And if you've been here on Engineers Day, I'm also kind of curious to find out if you have been here then because then you get some access to other parts of our facility. I will start with a brief little overview of the site. Um, some people get kind of confused because we talk about upbound and downbound when we're talking about vessel traffic. And most people kind of consider upbound to be north. Well, for us, upbound and downbound is actually a vertical indication. So at this lower end here, that's the east side of the, the facility and the upbound side is actually the west. So to look north, you're looking towards Canada this way across our facility. And um, a lot of the things I'm going to reference are going to be talking about upper and lower parts of the locks. And I will uh, be reintroducing some of these uh, vis visual uh, locators throughout the program. Uh, within the, the facility, we have the canals. And this one is indicated here. This is the MacArthur and the Pollock approach canal on each side. And then, of course, there is another set of canals to approach the Davis and Sabin locks. Right after the, between the approaches and the lock chamber are the four bays, which are indicated with this arrow. And then we have the lock gates. And then within that, of course, is the lock chamber. At the lower end of each of the locks, there is a guard gate. It's sit here in the recess. It's a little hard to see because of the angle of the shot. On the MacArthur lock, you can see that recess right there. Now these are reverse facing miter gates compared to the operating gates. And a miter gate means it, it closes together like this in a V shape, which helps deflect the water pressure. On the lower guard gates, those are used as temporary dams when we dewater for most years. Now you probably, uh, if you've watched a couple of these, you probably know that the end of our season is January 15th. And we have a little bit of a hoopla, who's going to be the last boat and when it goes through. And uh, we also then have the real last boat most years, which is a Coast Guard cutter. Once all of our traffic is done, we start dewatering the lock. Um, dewatering is kind of a strange word. And uh, your inclination is to call it draining the lock. But we're not using gravity to remove the water, so we technically can't call it draining. So we call it dewatering because this is when we use pumps to remove all the water. We have a different way of setting stop logs. Stop logs are is this big beam kind of looking thing. Uh, and these stack in the lock one on top of the other to form a temporary dam. We use a different setup, but I like this photograph so well that I've left it in. Um, this happens at the, at the ends of the four bays. So I have this red arrow pointing to where we have the stop log staged. Um, during most of the year. So when you've come to the Sioux Locks, if you've been in this observation platform, you've probably seen them stacked up and sometimes you'll see them lined up on the piers and sometimes they're lined up on the lower pier. These logs, oops, sorry. These logs are set at the, um, the edges of the four bays. So right about there at the upper end and here on the lower end. Uh, I mentioned we do it in a new way now. Now we use uh, cranes and barges instead of the stiff leg crane mounted permanently on the shore. Uh, so the stop logs here are, are ready to go on this barge. We have a, a modular barge here with a, one of our new uh, heavy lift cranes and then a tug will push it into position to start putting the logs in place. This is a little wider view looking downbound and you can see 
We have a crane that we're going to leave at the upper end of the lock this year. This was all done this uh, winter in January. And then this is the heavy lift crane that will drop these logs into place. You see some staged here on the pier. And then here's the barge coming with them. Oops. Um, here the, is a crew that is setting one of the, the first logs to go in. And if it looks like there's a lot of people standing around watching, there actually are, but there's a purpose for that. Um, this is not the sort of thing that we can just do a dry run during the season to practice to train new employees and new lock and dam operators. So this is a kind of all hands on deck when we do this. So we, we drop logs once a year, we lift them once a year. So we try to have all of the new guys there working with somebody experienced, watching, paying attention, and taking a small part here and there until they learn how to do this task. Um, these logs, you can see here there's three guys. And these two guys at the end of the logs there, they're actually helping guide the log into these slots, which are built into the lock wall. So these rollers help the log drop down smoothly. And then this guy is our signalman who is communicating with the crane operator to help keep the, the lift going smoothly. Now there's another team of people on the other end of this log doing the exact same thing to make sure that the load is lowered in a balanced way. Here's just a close up of these rollers that help it slide down in that slot. And then here, this line here is actually a sounding line. There's a sounding line put on each end of the log. And then there's a guy whose job is to monitor that because we have to make sure that these uh, drop evenly. We don't want the log to end up sideways or, or tilted in the, the recess because it could end up jammed and then we have a, a little bit of a mess. Um, once the stop logs were set this year, the heavy lift crane starts going back to the lower end of the lock and about halfway through, it placed this uh, panel bridge. The panel bridge weighed 67 tons partially assembled. So they had it partially assembled, they put it in place. The uh, guys on the on the wall helped guide it into its anchor spots. And then they uh, went through and then finished installing all the panels. And this was a, a really handy addition this year and they could drive heavy equipment over it. Uh, in the past, we had to have barges place everything in the lock before we dewatered. And this made it a lot more flexible to get equipment in and out of the work area. And this year, we use stop logs at the lower end, and I included this photo. We don't do stop logs at the lower end every year, but this was a great picture that shows that heavy lift crane and the modular uh, barge getting ready to drop this log right here. Now in a normal year, we use those guard gates that I mentioned. The guard gates here are not powered, so they're not operating gates. So we use winches that are up here on the, the by the buildings and this tug to push them into place. And I mentioned that these are miter gates, so they're at an angle. And that angle keeps the water pressure uh, diverted towards the lock monolith, which is where the strength is. And once that the pumps are fired up, these uh, and the, the water drops about two feet, there's enough head on the outer side of this these gates that it holds them shut. It's impossible to open them. So once that's all done and the pumps are getting ready to start up, we put divers in the water. The Sioux area office has its own dive team. And then the divers will go in and they check for large cracks where water might be flowing through. And then they use oakum to stuff into those cracks to help make the gate more watertight. And you can see they just put it in these special baskets and lower it down to a diver underneath. When the pumps are going, we have five pumps we use to dewater. This is the only time we use pumps to remove water from the lock. Um, it takes about 16 hours to remove about 30, 35 feet of water. And uh, these two guys right here are looking down into the deep well, which is below these two pumps in the administration building. And um, the best way to think about the way these pumps operate and the deep well is like a sump pump in your house. So this is just basically a supersized sump pump that goes about 100 or so feet down to remove the water from the, the locks. And as I mentioned, 16 hours later, we have an empty lock. And I'll point out some of the features again here that you can see um, within the lock chamber. 
Here we have the outlet ports. So that's where the water comes out when we're lowering the water level. Here's the first set of operating gates at the lower end. The second set of gates at the lower end. This part right here is the chamber. This is the upper sill. That's probably about a 20, 30 feet high there concrete to the upper level. And then these are the stop logs all set into place. And then uh, once that's done, we have the guys go in and start opening all the valves, which helps keep that water moving towards the deep well and the pumps. Then we have a bunch of repetitive tasks that have to happen every single year once we've dewatered. Uh, these guys are involved in laying up the lock. And uh, what they're doing here is they're installing uh, oak timbers beneath the half, or sorry, beneath the reverse tainer valve. And they have to do this because if we don't, those uh, valves will freeze to the lock floor. This is water. They're probably about ankle deep in water standing there. And it will eventually, as the temperature drops, that'll freeze. And we don't want those valves frozen to the floor. It could present a problem when we want to rewater in March. And also, they need to get through this sometimes. They need to be able to have people walking through or, or pushing carts through. So we need to keep that opening. Uh, of course, there's a lot of uh, time spent staging equipment. Everything that goes into the lock floor has to be lowered there by cranes or carried. There's a, just a dropping a bobcat on the lower end of the lock. There's those outlet ports I'd mentioned before. And here's the administration building. And then they have to get the manhole covers up. There are manhole covers all over the four bay in the po lock, and they have to get the covers off. And then they wedge them up out of place because what will happen if they don't? Those will freeze into place. And that can be a problem because we have to access those. Some tasks in Sault Ste. Marie, as you can imagine, are pretty much constant, like plowing and snow blowing and, of course, shoveling. And we also use steam pans, which is a little unique, to help deal with snow and ice especially on the gates. Uh, right here, you can see those steam pans, which are suspended from up above. Sometimes they'll put a tarp over top of them too, and that is to help get all this ice off of this gate. Uh, they'll use steam lines and steam pans on big ice piles like this to help get that melted and out of the way. We use insulated tarps. There's a little heating unit inside here to help keep those stop logs from freezing too badly. And maybe one of the more dramatic uh, measures we take is we use jackhammers. So here's a guy in a man lift using a jackhammer to remove ice. If that seems like a silly thing to be doing, maybe this puts it in a better context. He's up here jackhammering the ice away, which they've got this all cleared off now. If you can imagine if you have to have people working down here, that is a real hazard to life and limb to have that ice hanging over your head. And uh, here we're using a bobcat to move ice. And this is the area between the lower guard gates and the sill for the, the, I'm sorry, this is the stop logs at the lower end. And this is the sill for the guard gates where they're clearing this ice. Uh, just to re reorient uh, to where we are in the lock area again, this is where the stop logs are installed. The guard gate sill is about right here. So they're working in this area right here in that photograph. So this is where one of our cleanup crews was busy at the beginning of the season. You see all this ice they've pushed out of the way. This is before they've uh, started melting it. And then they're loading rocks and debris into the skip with the bobcat. Um, one thing I'll point out here is the guy in the bobcat is our senior most lockmaster of the four lockmasters we have. So he doesn't have to spend the day standing knee deep in ice water. He at least gets to ride in the bobcat. But one downside, he said, is that at the end of the day, you come out pretty kinked up from being curled up in that bobcat all day. So these guys are getting ready to lift the skip. And I will uh, point out here how big these rocks are. Believe it or not, these actually walk in or are, are driven in with the propeller wash of the freighters as they're coming and going in and out of the lock. Uh, the skip weighs, uh, carries, holds about 6,000 pounds. And uh, over the, the cleanup of the, just this one area, 
this crew removed about 600,000 pounds of rock. Now, normally we're able to clear this area. If we don't dewater it, we clear it with one of our crane barges and they can pick up the big debris. But by dewatering it this year, they were able to get a really thorough clean done and take out 600,000 pounds of rocks. Uh, while the bobcat and the crane are doing heavy lifting, uh, another guy is uh, over by the guard gates taking the rocks out by the shovel full. And uh, starting at the, oh, the drain crew, we're up to the drain crew. So uh, this job is one that happens throughout the whole season and it happens every single year. And if you watch Dirty Jobs, this is one of the jobs that Mike Rowe did on his show. And uh, another name for this job is called mucking. So this crew, this is an aerial view of the Pollock from 1968 before it was filled with water. This crew starts out working here. This is that four bay area. There are the lower guard gates in place. Here are the operating gates. So they start out here and they're gonna work their way up the entire lock chamber during the season. Their crew, their work starts by lowering the vacuum. This vacuum goes with them everywhere within the lock. They raise and lower it using cranes. And then of course, the, the, we pointed out those manholes that they had to secure off the ground before they could freeze. Well, they have to do that because they have to go down into those manholes. Some of these manholes are up to 25 feet deep. These guys have special training for confined spaces and fall protection. And we use air monitors to make sure that they have a safe workspace, even if it does happen to be a really miserable workspace. And uh, another thing I'll point out about this job is this is a job that goes to the thinnest and newest guys on the drain crew. And what he's doing in here, there is a, a connecting line from this manhole that goes to the next part of the drain system. And he's got a jetter right here, a high pressured water jetter. And then there's the vacuum tube. So he's using the jetter to try to clear a clog. And then he's got the vacuum ready to suck the debris out. They also have to go into spaces below the lock floor. And uh, this is a little less miserable than the manholes. And it's actually a lot warmer than the regular work. And uh, this might look like overkill with three guys here to run a vacuum cleaner, but it actually takes the three guys to do this smoothly. You got one guy here to wrangle the vacuum. You've got this guy who is kind of loosening up the debris to get the, so the vacuum can pick it up and tossing aside the rocks that are too big to fit in it. This guy is using that hammer. He's listening to the, the vacuum. When he hears it start to clog, he'll use that hammer to knock the clogs loose so that we have constant suction. And he will also remove large debris out of the way that won't fit through the nozzle. And while this looks pretty miserable, this actually isn't that bad of a job. Uh, water is pouring down on you the whole time through little holes in the four bay floor up above you, but it's actually pretty warm. The day that I was taking this photograph, it was maybe about 10 degrees outside. And if you'll notice, they've already, they've taken their coats off. I have a short video of this in in action, just so you can see kind of how they work together as a team. And the noise. And uh, it is noisy and very tedious. You look even with that giant vacuum cleaner, that's a pretty slow process. Um, over to the side is the pile of the rocks and debris that was too big to fit through the vacuum cleaner. And you'll see that they've got some bolts there and a couple tools. All of this has to then be loaded into buckets which have to be lifted out of that space. And for the most part, they find rocks and sand and the occasional bit of taconite but every once in a while, you find something interesting, like one of these pull top uh, can lids. I don't know how many people are my age and can remember cutting your foot on one of those little pull tabs. Uh, one of the most interesting finds I thought that we had just this year is someone contacted us probably around January 
and had reported that they had dropped their phone in the poll lock on Engineers Day. And if we found it, could we please send it back to them? We kind of had a little laugh about it in the office because the odds of finding it are pretty slim when you figure it's a 1,200 foot long lock and uh, 110 feet wide and all of the drains and under spaces and just even all of the stuff that would have been banging on that phone. But I'll be darned, they found the phone and they mailed it back to the people. So once they finished in the four bay up here, the crew then moves into the culverts, or on the, on the culverts, I'm sorry, into the lock chamber. Um, this year they had to go through the culverts to get to the lock chamber because of work on the sills. But they, they start cleaning these laterals. These laterals are where the water comes in and out of the pole lock. So you see there's three sets of three at the lower end and three sets of three at the upper end. Uh, this is, um, I'm missing a photo. Well, anyway, uh, here's a view from within the lock chamber looking up. So there's that sill at the upper end. And then here in these breaks in the snow, you can see those are where the laterals are. Now, this year they had to climb through the culverts to get to them. So you had to walk through the culverts uh, several hundred feet in the pitch dark. And then you get into the lateral. And this guy here is placing steam lines because they've got to melt all of the snow and ice so that they can get to the debris with the vacuum cleaner. And they need to remove the rocks and debris that get in here because if this fills up, we're going to lose our water flow. And also, if you've got too many large boulders banging around in there, it starts to damage the concrete structure. I mentioned we had to crawl through the culverts to get here. We walk through the culverts, the culverts are big, but when you get to these little laterals, you've got to bend in half to walk along. And then you go through this little opening, kind of like a walrus scoot on your side to get through. Uh, you go home pretty wet and dirty at the end of that day. Then of course they empty out the vacuum. Um, I don't have totals for this year, but in 2019, the drain crew removed about 15 tons of debris from the drains and the laterals. And that's something that happens every year. Uh, another nonstop job that we have every winter at the locks is replacing the fender timbers. We have miles of piers and the approaches in the lock gates are protected by these fender timbers. These are oak sections and uh, we had a pretty mild winter this year, so they were working from this scaffold, but most years it's not the case. Uh, during a cold snap in 2012, the crews had to use propane torches to thaw the timbers before they could drill them. They have to drill them to match up with the brackets that are installed on the pier wall and on the gates, and then they're lowered into place. Now this is kind of a more of a typical winter for us, so you'll see they're not restricted to working from that that uh, scaffold, which is actually kind of handy, even though it's miserable cold, they can work right on the ice and you can have some extra hands down there to help and more room to maneuver. So here's those brackets I mentioned. So they've got to line the holes up with the brackets and they'll start driving the pins in. Once the pins are in, they trim the pins, cut those off. And I would like to point out here real quick, you can see the new timbers and over here you see the old ones. So this really is a constant job that they're replacing them. The, the boats come in and they rub right along these walls, which wears out those timbers. Every uh, winter, we all, or I should say every winter, most winters when we dewater the lock, we'll also have a barge in the lock. Uh, this uh, does a nice double duty because we can use it as a dry dock if we need to work on it. And it also gives us a crane in the lock for moving heavy equipment in and out. This year, uh, we didn't put a crane in the lock, but we had this barge, which needed an inspection. And this was able to do double duty by putting, they put a little mobile break room on that, that uh, barge so that the guys working on the lock floor didn't have to go all the way up. Basically, it's about five stories to get to break room areas. And it's not in the photo, but uh, just for your own peace of mind, they had some porta johns down there too. Every uh, time, or I should say every five years, it, when we dewater the lock, we have to have a physical inspection, which is what these people are doing. So they go through, they evaluate the condition of the lock, they compare change from last time they did an inspection, they identify future projects that they might need to uh, get into the work plan, and they also identify immediate problems that are going to need attention. Some major projects that end up being planned are things like replacing the sills, 
So that this guy is doing some finish work on some concrete on the MacArthur Lock sill. Uh, the sills, this is a picture of the MacArthur Lock, are these raised parts of the concrete you can see here and the lock structure. This is at the upper end looking down. So here's the chamber. And then these gates swing open and they rest against these sills. And that's what helps uh, cause a seal that lets them control the water flow in and out of the chamber. And what had happened is a part of the sill was worn and had to be replaced. Now this work actually starts with a survey and they'll be doing surveys throughout the entire process. They have to document exactly the elevation and location of those sills, because if they're even an inch off, that gate will not work and we'll have a, a non-operating lock. Um, this is done throughout the project. He'll keep coming back to check to make sure that they're still dead on for their elevations and their locations. Uh, we replaced uh, two of the sills in the Polock this year, and this started out with contractors using diamond saws to score the concrete here. So they're, they're cutting it into manageable sections. Then they're followed up with a guy on a big, big concrete saw who is cutting it into the blocks then. I don't know how many blades they went through, but there was a big stack of blades for this project. Then the, the sections are all lifted out. Our guys then start installing the new forms. And here's more of the installing the, the forms. They're followed up by a welder who's going to secure them all into place. This is all at the upper end. Then they're going to build a shelter over the, the, the sill area because, of course, the concrete has to have a climate controlled um, area to cure properly. And then installing the rebar, a lot of rebar. And what they're actually doing here, these guys are cutting rebar and installing it. These guys are running heat lines. So these, uh, these are heat lines to help keep the form heated up because the concrete has to be kept above 55 degrees for it to cure properly. And as you can imagine, that is a real challenge in Sault Ste. Marie in February. And the concrete starts coming in. Um, just like all the equipment, this has to be lowered down from the top. So there's a cement truck up here. They fill that hopper. A crane lowers it down. Then this uh, piece of equipment picks up the, the hopper, brings it over to the job site where they've removed a portion of the shelter's roof to get access to the concrete. Um, for the, these two sills, we used 80 yards of concrete. Uh, to put that into a little bit of perspective, if you were going to tackle this as a home project, that's uh, 4,050 bags of concrete and about eight to 10 dump, or uh, not dump trucks, cement trucks. Then, of course, they have to get the concrete into place. And then, of course, finishing the concrete. They did all of this in just a few days once they started placing the concrete. Basically, the, the finishing and placing it was one day. Uh, gate repairs is another thing we have to do during the winter season. Uh, these are the MacArthur lock gates. They were assembled in place in 1943. And I'll point out right here, this is the low pool water level. So when the lock chamber is at the Lake Huron level, this is where the water would be. So when it's at the Lake Superior level, it's up here. So this part of the gate, unless the, the lock is dewatered, is always submerged. So the crew starts out inspecting the lock, the uh, gates, checking the, co the, the, the condition of the steel, and then marking things that need to be repaired. And then they come through and start uh, cleaning and welding the cracks that they found. You see this uh, chalk mark to help them find it after the inspection. And this is actually a two-man job. It looks like that guy is just standing there watching. And that is actually a big part of his job. There's one guy welding, one guy watching. Because sometimes the welder ends up catching himself on fire. You can see here he's, uh, his coat's not going home in the same condition it was in. But the guy watching is able to see if any sparks have caught something. And then they get right on top of it right away. Uh, gate coating is another huge uh, task we undertake. Um, I My inclination is to call it painting, but they have been very clear that it is not painting. It's actually a vinyl coating. It's not paint that is applied to the gates. Um, these are the lower gates of the Pollock, and these uh, are 60 feet tall. 
and 63 feet wide. Each leaf, so this section and this section, each is a leaf, those weigh 225 tons. To do this project, they had to encapsulate them, insulate them basically, because of course it have to be heated for the coating to cure correctly. And they had 57 days to do this project including removing and reinstalling all of the fenders, the wiring, the grease lines, everything. And of course, reinstalling them. Here they're uh, doing the blasting to remove the original coating off the, the gates. It took 310 tons, or yes, 310 tons of abrasive for blasting this off. And of course they had to be primed. And then after the top coat was applied, there was the big reveal. So you see here the, the nice new coating on those gates. And then of course they had to do a little bit of touch up. Uh, in all this project took 2000 gallons of vinyl coating. And this is a, a substance specially designed for marine projects. And remember the physical inspection, sometimes they find surprises. In 2015, they found a crack in one of the pintle sockets. Uh, this crack is only a few inches but this is a really critical part of the operating gates and it required immediate attention. Uh, my son was kind enough to put together this drawing to help me illustrate how important uh, this socket is. So this is a drawing, this is the gate up above it. At the upper end, this is 143 tons. This is the pintle socket. This is the, so the pintle. And then there's the pintle base, which is embedded in the concrete, which is part of the, the lock. So the entire gate swings on this pintle from this uh, socket. And then of course there's an anchorage that holds it up at the top. So you can imagine that finding a crack in this is pretty much something that's not gonna wait till next year. So in this photo of the lower gate, here's where we're talking about. There's the socket base underneath that, I mean, sorry, the socket, um, yes, the socket. And underneath that is the pintle and the pintle base. So to do this, they had to jack the gate up. Remember, it's 143 tons. They used three hydraulic jacks, and they build up cribbing to support the gate. Here's one of those, those jacks. This is a 200-ton jack. There's three of them. And then they build up the cribbing as they're raising it. They raise the gate one-tenth to three tenths of an inch at a time. And after every single movement, they have to measure it at the top, measure it at the bottom, and check all the plumb lines because they've got to make sure that they're raising it level. It's one of these situations we don't want to end up with it tilted. A new pintle socket had to be cast from the original drawings. And of course, things settle and change, and sometimes the way things are drawn is not the way they end up in reality. So this had to be lowered down to the lock floor, tried in place. So they had to measure it and mark it, and then it went back to our machine shop where they did the fine tuning to get it to fit correctly. They're using a vertical boring mill, and here they're removing 3 16ths of an inch to get it to fit correctly. Once it's all sized and ready to go, they have to lower it back down and then um, install it on the pintle. This is the pintle. This is, if I remember correctly, stainless steel. It's all greased up now, ready for the socket. And this weighs about a thousand pounds. They use pry bars, come alongs, and just a lot of effort to get this uh, socket into place. The socket weighs 2,170 pounds. Once done, the gate will be lowered again, again going one-tenth to three-tenths of an inch at a time. And then when it's finally back in position, the socket will be secured to the gate. And one of the amazing things to me is this entire process, including casting a new socket, had to be done in just 10 weeks. Another unexpected project that we had this year was in the culvert behind the lower valve. So this is happening right about here in the inside the lock so actually in the monolith it's about 200 feet from the four bay air entrance area um, here's a picture of the culvert so this part right here is the culvert on the south side and this is the one on the north side the repair had to be done on this north side 
Uh, this is about the high pool water line on the lock chamber. So during their inspection of the culvert, this is a picture from inside the culvert looking towards the outlet ports, they found a big chunk of concrete just laying in the, the, on the floor. Uh, this piece of concrete was about two feet by three feet, and it was a foot to a foot and a half high. So that's a pretty sizable discovery. I didn't get a picture before they started working, but here you can see that that little chunk of concrete missing is actually pretty small compared to what was missing in the, the lock wall behind the, the valve. Uh, here they've been installing rebar and pins to hold the forms. Uh, an interesting challenge with this, you remember I mentioned everything has to be lowered from the surface to the lock floor. So that includes the electric lines had to come down through the valve shaft and all of these pieces of scaffold and all of the equipment and gear and heaters had to be carried, uh, lowered to the lock floor and then carried 200 feet through the culvert in the pitch dark to get to the work site. Um, my slides have uh, shifted on me just a moment. Um, we have custom cut sheets of steel that they used to create the form. These are about a quarter inch thick and they were secured in place. Um, the holes had to be pre-drilled in our machine shop about a quarter mile away and of course about 60 feet up on the surface. And luckily most of them all fit. There were a few that were just slightly off but none of the sheets had to go back. They were able to work everything back into the positions to get the form secured. Uh, again, we're, we're bringing everything down from the surface, and this was coordinated with the pouring of the concrete for the sills, which is what's happening within the structure. So they were getting a hopper, and they would fill up this mechanical wagon. And if you watch Dirty Jobs, you probably remember that these are not so easy to drive. So they load up this full of concrete, and then he's got to drive it 200 feet through the culvert, past there, to get to the area that they're working in. Once they get to the area they're working in, they work pretty quickly and they have to transfer it all into five gallon buckets and then they carry it up almost fire brigade style, handing bucket to bucket to bucket, handing it up until they're able to place it behind that form. And we got a couple of pictures of the finished work. So there is the repaired patched concrete ready to go for the next navigation season. And then finally, eventually, everything is done and it's time to rewater the lock. Well, actually, there's a few things that have to do before they can rewater the lock. So a lot of times, depending on the severity of the winter, we have to thaw out the stop logs because they will freeze even sometimes when they're insulated. Uh, this is a picture, as you might have guessed, of the stop logs that are going across the MacArthur lock because you see there's already traffic happening for the Po. So they've got steam lines in there and then once they get the, most of the ice melted, there were still some places that were stuck and pinned. So there's actually a guy in there with a steam line who is melting the ice and then he has to toss it out of the, the logs so that they can lift these. Now that's happening on the side facing into the lock chamber. On the outside of the lock chamber, uh, because of the cold and steel being a good conductor of cold, it forms face ice along this surface, which is basically a crystal clear um, solid ice, it can extend up to four feet out. Now, most years, if the weather's not too bad, they're able to control this with bubblers. So they'll have bubblers and steam lines or, or air lines going along here. It recirculates all of the warmer water from the bottom of the river along the face of the stop logs. And then that will uh, melt that face ice so that they can lift the logs. This is a year, this is 2014. You might remember it was a really bad one. This is a steam pipe that they've modified, and it has holes all throughout its length, and they are going to lower it down, kind of like trying to cut a, a knife through butter with that heat going through that face ice. This took pretty much overnight, and then they were able to lift the logs. Uh, as I mentioned, this is how we used to water or rewater the lock. Uh, this was actually a really exciting process. We do it different now. 
Um, but like we would all, quite often have uh, the local TV news stand channel would come, they'd send a reporter and a cameraman. Um, people would come out from the offices to watch. The sound is just thunderous, the, the water sprays. Sometimes you get rainbows if it's a sunny day. And if you're standing on the gates in front of this, they, they shake and vibrate. It's a, it was a really exciting thing. People would come out from the offices to watch. Here you see a whole batch of people who have got their cell phones out getting video and photos of this happening, uh, except for this guy. That's one of our chief lock masters, and I guess he's seen it before. Um, I mentioned we have a new way we do it now. We have new logs, and these new logs have sluices built into this level of log, and they open those sluices. It's not nearly as exciting. Um, I was really kind of disappointed. At first, I was uh, disappointed because no one told me they were rewatering the lock. Usually, they would tell me well in advance. I get in position, and I'm ready to take the photos and the videos when the drama starts. Someone came in and said, hey, did you know they're rewatering the lock? I was like, oh, no. And I jumped on a cart and went zipping up to the upper end, and then I saw it, and I was like, oh, I didn't need to hurry. Got my photos. Um, this took almost 24 hours to fill the lock this way. Uh, an advantage of it, though, is they don't need a, heav a heavy lifting crane above the lock to raise the logs. And this year, of course, as I mentioned, we had stop logs across the lower end, so we had to lift those before we could um, open up for business. But in a normal year, when we're using the guard gates, we have some different challenges. As I had mentioned, the guard gates are not powered, so we use a tugboat to push them into position. And then, unfortunately, this is a really bad year. I keep going back to 2014. This is 2014. And there's a lot of ice. So they're using boat hooks to try to move ice out of the recess. And then, of course, they're also trying to prevent more of this ice from drifting back into it. And the boat hooks was just not working. So they ended up bringing out a big airline. It's about a four-inch airline. And they were able to blast the ice, broke up some of the bigger pieces, and got it moving. Until then, they were able to finish clearing it with, with the boat hooks and secure these guard gates into their recesses in the lock wall. Now, the, the big fuss is always about the first freighter, and we always talk about March 25th because that's when we go back into business for the season. But to be honest, our first lockage is usually closer to March 20th, and it's usually one or more icebreakers. We're going to head out into Whitefish Bay to open up the bay for shipping. And of course, right on time, uh, these boats are here lined up, ready and waiting. And this is a picture from 2016. We had three of them waiting for midnight when the lock opens. In the 10 years that I've been working here, uh, we have never been late opening the lock. So we're all pretty proud of that. Uh, sometimes there are no boats there yet, but we are there ready and have the lock open. Uh, with that, I'll uh, thank you for your attention and I will turn it back over to Sarah, and I will get ready to start answering your questions. Well, thank you, Michelle, for that program. I don't know about any of you, but it's been really hot in Duluth this summer and looking at all of that ice and snow has been really refreshing. Uh, before we get into the question, portion, I just wanted to let everyone know what the status of our visitor centers are. Uh, at in Duluth, uh, we are continuing to provide services like uh, vessel information and providing announcements to the visitors in the park. We also have a cell phone tour outdoors that people can participate in and just learn more about the area down here on their cell phones. And uh, starting, well, we started on July 1st providing outdoor guest services. So we've got tables set up outside with rangers that can answer questions and provide information to visitors. At the Sioux Locks, they have installed exhibits. They're inside exhibits outside in their park for people to look at in the park. The park is always is open. Uh, they've They've uh, started or they've re reopened their shipping hotline. So that number is listed on the screen. So they have uh, 
schedules of the boats coming into and out of the Sioux Locks, along with providing arrival announcements. And they are providing guest services outside as well. They've set up an area outside their visitor center to provide information. And both of our visitor centers will open when they can comply with state and federal guidance and when local health conditions permit. And I'm putting up another uh, slide here. This has Michelle's contact information on it. And I'll put have this up for a few minutes while we are thinking about questions here. Um, so Michelle, did you wanna start the questions? Can you sure. see them on the Okay. I can see them. Um, so okay. one of the questions is how do they stay warm? in February? Well, we provide them with excellent gear. Um, they have the, the best possible gear that we can get for temperature. Um, we also, our safety mon officer and the like uh, crew leaders are also monitoring conditions because we do occasionally in the Sioux have conditions where it is too cold to work outside safely. So in the Corps of Engineers, there's a lot of mandatory training we have to do. Uh, there's first aid training, there's just all kinds of mandatory trainings. So a lot of times they'll have some of that kind of stuff in their back pocket. So if we get a day when it's too cold to work outdoors, they'll have the crews come inside and get some of the training taken care of. Um, it's also not uncommon for us to be in conditions where they're able to work safely outside for about 45 minutes to an hour at a time, and then they have to do uh, spells to warm up. Um, in the Davis building, which is where the lock and dam operators are, are working out of in the winter, um, they also have uh, boot dryers. So at the end of the day, after standing knee deep in water, they can put their boots on the boot dryers and help take care of that equipment. And they're also big fans of those hot shot things, uh, the, the little heater packs you put in your mittens. So there's the, the main strategies, but I will say uh, also you just get cold and you, you tough it out. Um, the, the pose upper and lower gates, I'm, I'm not as clear on the upper gates. The upper gates will be 63 feet wide like the lower gates are. I do not remember in my head how tall they are, but they are of course um, much shorter than the lower gates because they only need to extend from the upper sill to the Lake Superior level. The lower gates are 60 feet high, weigh 225 tons. The um, upper gates weigh 143 tons, so that'll give you a little bit of uh, the discrepancy in size there. Uh, next one here, is the water in the lock always Lake Superior water? Uh, yes, it always is. The water only ever goes from Lake Superior to Lake Huron. It never goes in reverse the other way. Uh, gravity doesn't work that way. So the water is always going from the Lake Superior level through those culverts, through the laterals, and then out again through the laterals and through the culverts to the Lake Huron level. The length of the pole lock between the um, miter gates. Uh, within the, the chamber of the lock, which would be the operating gates that kind of define the lock chamber, it's 1,200 feet long. And someone's asked what the edge of the miter gates, where they meet, is it wood or what they fit so well it's not needed. Um, there are a lot of rubber seals on the gates, but I have not really paid attention to what that meeting point is uh, comprised of. Um, but I do know that they're not 100% watertight. There's usually some water that is kind of flowing and trickling through even when the gates are closed. Anything else? I'm just putting up some contact information for both of our uh, visitor centers. We both have uh, Facebook pages, our associations do, and the Duluth District uh, Army Corps of Engineers has a Facebook page, as well as a web page and uh, a YouTube channel where the recorded programs will be. The Sioux Locks Vessel Hotline is listed, as well as the Twin Ports Vessel Hotline, and 
The Twin Ports vessel schedule can also be found on harborlookout.com. We've also got an email list. If you wanted to send a message to this email at Gmail um, and be informed of any future programs by email, you can send a message there or ask us questions through, the, through that email. Uh, we've also got a survey that is about five minutes long, probably a little bit less than five minutes. That'll help us to uh, improve our programs and think, you know, if you've got any suggestions for different programs that we can do in the future, you can put that on the Survey Monkey. And I just wanted to let you know again about our upcoming program next week, which will be the revealing process that made the Lake Superior Basin. Uh, Ranger Steve will be talking about how uh, the geologic processes that formed the Great Lakes. So that'll be on next Thursday, July 16th at 1130 a.m. Central or 1230 p.m. Eastern. And it looks like another question popped in. Oh, how do they keep ice off the lock walls? Um, we have airlines that run on the upper sides of the gates. So we actually use that even during navigation. So we have these powerful blasts of air that help keep ice moving and keep it from forming. Now on the lock walls themselves within the chamber, um, what we all sometimes have to do is we have our tugs that are specially fit, um, or I should say reinforced so that they can scrape ice off the walls. So the, the tugs will be scraping ice from the walls. When it freezes during winter work, they'll use those steam pans. We'll stay on for a few more minutes if anyone thinks of any more questions.